Well, folks, it's another edition of the uh, radio show with Mark Lee. Yours truly, your host, Mark Lee, here, ready to have another exciting conversation with uh, several guests uh, during the course of the two shows that I do here on the international broadcast media. Of course, we've got the radio show, and then at 4 o'clock, we'll have Mullins and Music and Memory. So definitely, I know a lot of folks are enjoying the fact that we're having much better weather than we've had in the uh, past and all of that. So definitely, it's sunny and lovely on the outside here in Durham, North Carolina. And I know a lot of folks are paying attention to a number of things happening in the world. A lot of folks are still paying attention to the uh, pandemic that we're in the middle of, as well as a number of other things that are going on in society as well. So definitely folks are paying attention to that. And of course, people have also been paying attention to the sports world in addition to everything else. As a matter of fact, we know that this evening there will be a championship game. And I know that I was watching the game between the um, the semifinal game. It was actually a thrilling victory and all of that. UCLA almost pulled it off. Don't have any dog in this particular fight, but Gonzaga was the winner. But it was an overtime game, and it came down to a last-second shot. So then I watched the women play, and they were also very exciting as well. Another last-second shot. Only in this case, the shot did not go in, and therefore the uh, team did win that was uh, defending. So in that case, it was uh, Stanford against Arizona. And like I said, Stanford went ahead and pulled off that victory in the women's championship as the Arizona guard was not able to have the shot hit and go in and all of that. But definitely two thrilling games, and I'm hoping that we have another thriller this evening as well. But a lot of people, like I said, are paying attention to a number of things going on around the world. Folks are getting those stimulus checks as well as um, definitely getting the vaccines and all of that. So definitely that's some of the things that are going on in this neck of the woods. But I've got some amazing guests and I'd like to bring uh, them in and talk a conversation with them to see what they're all about. And I met both of them through the wonders of Potted, a great source for meeting people and all of that. So definitely I'm about to bring in John Yeager first. And then I've also got um, Cal, uh, Kala with me as well. So definitely looking for, to some great conversations and some interesting conversations as well. So definitely I'm going to bring in John first and see what John's got going on. And then we'll just continue <clears throat> the conversations as we go along. So hope everybody is going to have a great day and enjoy our conversations here on International Broadcast Media. How you doing, John? How's everything going? Like I said, uh, definitely has been a pleasure to meet a lot of great and positive people through that source known as Potted. I discovered them not that long ago, and I've found some great guests and everything. So I know that you are a psychology consultant and a performance coach. So you've actually worked with uh, athletes, and the other person I've got on the show as well is an athlete. So they right. might have some thoughts as well. But I'd love to hear you talk about um, definitely the coaching zone and how we can even uh, navigate our lives. Because I know a lot of times when I talk to people, they even wonder – you know, even in business, do I need a coach or do I not need a coach? And it seems to me that if you're going to be a business person, an entertainer or anything, you need a coach because you need somebody that can help guide you in what you're doing. I know even in the field of radio and media, I've had my coaches, but sometimes people feel that they can do it on their own. But I was just wondering your thoughts about how you got into this and also about the necessity for coaching. Well, thanks for having me on, Mark. Uh, I was an athlete for many, many years until my body gave out. And uh, I also coached for around 45 years of my life, if you can see the, the gray hair right here. Yeah. Um, and I found I was always fascinated with the why, why behind behavior and why, what is the purpose of athletes playing sports and also what is the purpose of, of coaching. And in my new book, The Coaching Zone, I talk a lot about how coaches really need to look at their purpose in their, their motivation, you know, in the things that they do. You know, two, two interesting stories that come to my mind. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I, I liked to run. And um, I uh, uh, signed up for a road race on July 4th in Framingham, Massachusetts, which is 20 miles west of Boston. Mm -hmm. My father drove me down there, and the race was going to be right before the 4th of July parade. And uh, I got down there, got to the starting line, and I found that everybody else at the race was were adults. 
And I was oh, uh, basically six or seven years younger than everybody else. And I could feel that stress build up on me. And I said, I don't know if I want to do this right now. And uh, feeling very fearful, stressed out, looked over at my father. My father gave me a smile. And what that smile really meant was, you want to do this? Great. You don't want to do it? It's okay. So I stayed on the starting line. The gun went off. I finished dead last. Three miles later, the parade almost caught up to me. And, uh, but I remembered that smile from him said everything. And in many ways, he was my first coach. And I've always been fascinated with coaches that I've had since then, you know, who've been able to cultivate connections, you know, effectively challenge athletes and, 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 and third kind of let go of control and let athletes do their thing with some leadership in some direction. And as you were mentioning before, Mark, whether this be coaching in sports, leaders coach that in business, parents coach our coaches at home. I mean, we all do that to a certain degree um, in different ways that we lead. And in my book, The Coaching Zone, Next Level Leadership in Sports, this is kind of a guide for new and seasoned coaches to kind of, one, increase their own self-awareness. And what I mean by that is that that coaches so often, you know, will look at the X's and O's, but really to look at why I'm doing what I'm doing. What are my strengths? What are my shortcomings? What are my stories? What do those stories say about what I've done? And how do my stories come alive when I communicate that with the athletes? And so I think those are those are very, very important things. And that leads to kind of the second part of the book is how do we lead and empower the athletes that we work with, or if it's business, the employees that we work with, or our children at home. Good. And do we provide enough direction? Do we provide enough empowerment? And how do we kind of hit the sweet spot with that by, by doing that? You know, and, and the third piece in there is kind of choreographing or orchestrating the team dance. You yeah. know, it's what, is this, what is the flow and rhythms of a family, of a business organi- business team, of an athletic team and how can coaches know when to go in there and to make shifts in those types of behaviors of things that are happening. So in many ways, coaches need to shift from self to others, to the wider world of the team in different ways in order to be doing that at the right time for the right reason to be most effective out there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Who do you think are some of the most effective coaches? I know that I'm here in uh, the Carolinas, and we actually just had one of our top coaches just resign and all of that, that being uh, Roy Williams, who has decided to step down from Carolina. And a lot of people talked about his leadership skills. And, of course, his predecessor was the great Dean Smith. And a lot of people talked about his leadership styles and even how he oftentimes would be involved in issues that a lot of times folks did not expect coaches to be involved in because there was even talk about how how Dean was involved as a leader in the civil rights struggle because of some of the decisions that he made when his early coaching career and all of that. And I actually saw another example of that this past weekend. Like I was saying, I watched a little bit of the sports world and I saw that Miss Barnes, who is actually a working mom, who is also still going to continue her coaching. She decided that she would still be the coach on the field and make all the kind of arrangements that she needed to do in order to take care of her child as well, because she felt that that's something that she wanted to do in a way to kind of like honor the role of women in the working environment. And she took care of her child even while still coaching. But I'm just wondering if you could talk about who some of those people are that you think are great coaches. And also, do you think that that's a good role for coaches to kind of like take leadership roles, even in things that are outside of their coaching field? Well, to answer this too, in many ways with Adia Barnes and and watching that game last night, back and forth, watching her, and her, her work out there, and then Tara Vanderveer, who was the Stanford coach. Right. With Adia Barnes, even though today in social media it came up, there's some things happened in the huddle afterward that's went viral and stuff like that. But above and beyond that, uh, what I saw at the end of the game, as soon as the, the whistle blew at the end of the game, she called her whole team over to her and hugged yes. Aria, uh, Aria McDonald right away and 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 basically – got them to together and just getting them to deal with some of the grief or loss, you know, part of sports and, and uh, Drew uh, Highland, who was a sports philosopher at Trinity college once said, uh, you know, sports make us, makes us complete. makes us feel whole. 
and um, and it takes two teams out there to make this dance happen. And and basically, she was doing the best to make sure that her players felt whole at that time. And you look over at Tara Vandeveer, different style of coaching, but just really working working in ways to bring out the best of their players. And you go back to somebody like like Roy Williams, okay, and who who you know just did an amazing job, you know, at at North Carolina. And I think getting involved in other types of issues is really important. Really knowing your athletes and knowing what they're all about, what their interests are, what their strengths and what their shortcomings are. So to know in what 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 are the things that they believe in. And I think that's really important for for coaches today to do. I mean, it's almost, you have to go past, it's mandatory that you go past the X's and O's and begin to know your players at at, at a greater level than you have in the past. Three different ways. One is that you develop a vulnerability trust with them. And that trust is all about, as a coach saying, you know, I make mistakes also. These are, you know, that, that I don't have it all down there too. And I might make a mistake in how I communicate with you with something. Okay. And that kind of helps with building that trust so that athletes feel that when they make a mistake, they're not automatically going to look over their shoulder back at the coach or they're going to be pulled out of the game right away. Those are types of situations where, you know, where coach, where they feel that, you know, if I fail, you know, I, I'm, I'm still a good person. You know, I, I, and it's one of the few ways that I grow is through failure. You know, and the third place, third piece is that everybody matters. Right. Uh, Catherine De Lorenzo, who's a women's field hockey coach at uh, Middlebury College in Vermont, talks about athletes having a scope of con- contribution, and she's very clear on making sure her athletes understand what scope they have and how they contribute with a team, whether they're a starter, starter, or they're a role player. And she was talking once, and I interviewed her for the book, about one of her athletes who saw very little time out there. But she was so, this athlete was so important in practices, but also in scouting with the other team that she brought it all together when it came time, you know, for things to happen with the game. So so they understood it that way, you know. Um, Another another coach, uh, his name was Andrew, when he played uh, high school basketball in California in the LA area, his coach was Yutaka Shimazu, who was an incredible basketball coach for, for almost 50 years. And basically uh, Shimazu uh, kind of communicated with, with Andrew saying, you know, you're, you're not, you're not my number one guy, even off the bench, but you know, and you read teams better than most other people. Can you help me out here? So in many ways, Andrew was almost like an assistant coach. And so this is where if you find roles for the athletes and have them feel as if they matter, that's really, really important. Is it perfect? No, no. But as I said before, part of sports is a sense of feeling complete and part of something and using the cliche part of something greater than that oneself, you know, uh, but, but it's really important. And I think coaches have a responsibility to help or orchestrate and choreograph that mark. No, I definitely agree with you, and it's interesting you say that because um, I actually um, did not do any um, college sport, but I did do sports in high school, and that was way back when because I'm in my late 50s now and everything. But that's actually kind of the role that I felt that I had in everything was because I was not a good track runner. I ran the uh, 880 and the mile. I thought that I was going to be a marathon runner or a long-distance runner, and I'm getting ready to bring Calla in very shortly to talk about some of the things that she's done and all of that. But I was not good whatsoever in the field. So, but I was a good recruiter. Still, I'm a good recruiter. Still, I'm a good networker. So I recruited the team that we put on the field and we won three out of four years of my running. Cause like I said, I ran 10th, 11th and 12th and we were allowed cause it was a three year high school, but we were allowed in our senior year of our junior high to be part of the track team as well. So I ran and did, uh, good even though i didn't like do good in the race but i did good in terms of recruiting we won a number of races and i hate to say it john but i think that the reason we lost it by senior year was because i got tired of losing so i recruited (laughs) somebody that i knew i could beat and that (laughs) might have cost us the victory and everything i think we lost 
by like a point or two, and we didn't really have anybody that could do the pole vault or a number of the other kinds of events like that. So I just got tired of losing and uh, was a little bit on the selfish side. And I know that's not something that coaches want to hear, but that's actually what I did. And like I said, it might have cost us my senior year and all of that. But I know that that's just kind of like my story of being involved in that and everything. And I also know Another story that I share, and like I said, I'm going to bring Kala in as well, but another story that I like to share is that um, when I was at a summer journalism camp um, studying this great field of journalism and everything, I was challenged in a race. And, of course, you know, if you're a high school kid, you've got a little bit of that bravado and all of that. So I was like, sure, I can win. I'm going to beat this guy. And I knew that there was probably no chance of me beating him whatsoever. So I took up the challenge and, like, accepted his gauntlet that he threw down in me yeah. and all of that. And um, then I talked myself out of going to the race because I was like, I know I'm going to get smoked in this race, so there's no need for me to go to the race. It kind of comes down to your story about your um, – parents and everything so i was like there's no way i'm gonna make this race i know i'm gonna lose and it's gonna be embarrassing my uh people that are here in this camp with me are gonna see me lose they're gonna be embarrassed so i talked myself out of going and i think i waited till way in the evening time like maybe five or six and as i was going down there i saw my friends coming back and they were, i was like so did we'll just say a name did jack make it to the race and uh what, you know what kind of excuse did y'all give for me and everything and they were like Jack didn't show up either. So I just gave it to myself into thinking that I was going to like get beat by this guy. He probably was uh, selling wolf tickets as well. And apparently he didn't show up also. So when they were sitting there just staring at a track and all of that, but definitely uh, Kala, I'm glad that you were able to join us. And I know that you are a coach as well. You've done work in the triathlon field. And I would love to hear about this work that you've done in the triathlon field. That's not a, uh, race that I would probably even dare to do, even though my brother has tried some of those endurance races and all of that, but he's uh, didn't have much luck either because he got injured, I think, the two or three times he tried it. So the family basically was like, no, Malik, that's my brother's name. You just need to give up on those kind of races because I think the two times he tried those endurance races, he broke something. So I think my parents were like, no, we need to find you something else for a hobby. But triathletes, I have a great deal of admiration for them. So if you could share a little bit about your background, and then I definitely want to continue this whole conversation around coaching and uh, what we think are great ideals of ideals of coaching. Awesome. Well, first, Mark, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, and John, it's really great to meet you. Like, what a great resource for me to, I, I took furious notes while you were talking as I was backstage. So um, Thanks, to be Tyler. amongst such uh, excellent people is is really an honor. So Mark, you got it right. I am a coach, um, a triathlon coach, but I became a coach because I fell in love with triathlon. And I wanted to make sure that other people who looked like me were at the start lines of races. And I figured that the only way that I would be able to do that was to be the coach that welcomed and accepted them into the triathlon world and then showed them how to get to that start line. So um, I've been, it's so you guys were talking about all these sports teams and I'm like, I don't know any of them. I know a little bit. I mean, you can't you can't not know about the Gonzaga game, right? And like the the thing at the end of the game, like that was whatever. Um, I've been an athlete almost my entire life, um, and I've always been coached in one way or another. So, John, I'm I'm right with you. The value of coaching, I think, is just um, undescribable, and that was part of the reason why I became a coach because I know the value myself how coaching sort of helped me become a better athlete and a better human and all that stuff. Um, so I swam all in high school and um, I always hated running. So I was, Mark, you're a runner. You've got the hardest part done. We just got to get you in the pool and put you on a bike and have you do some strength and some balance training so you don't get hurt like your brother did. Like you, you've got it down. You've got it down. Um, yeah, so I came to triathlon because I started running even though I didn't like it. Um, and I wanted to become a better runner. And so you cross train to do that. Um, and so I got back in the pool, remembered how to swim. I got myself a bike. I started cycling around. I thought, 
I should do races. So I sort of got into the swimming race side of things. And then I started looking at cycling races and everyone's like, well, what kind of cycling? Because if it's, you know, velodrome, if it's road, if it's crypt, if it's triathlon, I was like, triathlon, what's that now? And that was just sort of the end of everything. Like it's putting three things together, doing an incredible challenge, um, feeling super strong right when you finish, like having the commitment to your training. Um, and then of course, there's just a whole community out there of all of us that are just silly enough to want to do something like this. So um, you can't you can't help but fall in love with it. And I'm sure your brother would agree, even though he kept getting hurt, he probably made some lifelong friends in that community. So yeah, so it's a really long roundabout way of saying I love it. And that's why I became a coach. Uh, yeah, he definitely uh, still loves it. Like you said, he made friends in that community and he's now involved in another community because he's involved in the community of people that run uh, those, I call them the Batmobile cars, but they're like those Polaris cars and all of that. So during this whole time of COVID and everything, his group of car uh, enthusiasts, they actually went out and um, like he's uh his girlfriend's daughter was graduating uh, last year. So they actually went and uh, did like a graduation drive-by since she was not able to have the traditional graduation ceremony and all of that. And she just loved it. And they were finding other ways to get involved in community. That's one of the things that I've noticed about coaches as well as even the triathlete community and even the bicycling community is that it does seem to be very much about community. So I was wondering if both of you could talk about that aspect because it definitely seems to me that within sports altogether it's very much about community and uh enhancing our community uh skills and all of that because i don't know anybody that's involved in any form of exercise whether it's bicycling or whether it's running or a number of others that don't have that community aspect but i'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on that yeah well well i think the the community that's developed with the team is so powerful Okay, and even Kyler, as you're saying, the the community that you develop, you know, with your ath your triathletes, and then that community that that kind of goes there is where people have some level of a shared identity or common ground for the things that they do, and that basically what they can then do is they can kind of thread off there, branch out of there, and spread the things that matter most to them to other people, and that's where we can get ground swells. Of, of that. And, and so often we see with athletic teams is that we get communities that come around uh, athletic teams and everybody wants to be on a team. And if, you know, we look at politics, you know, people want to be on one of those teams or maybe as a libertarian, a third team. OK, whether whether they believe the ideology or not, they want to be there. But when you really believe in the philosophy, believe in the ideology, that's really important to, to have. And that can spread itself through different communities. And I've seen this a lot where, where a lot of athletic teams will go out and, and perform community service, not as just something extra to do or some sort of promotional thing to, to, to help to defray costs of the team, but literally go out because it's the right thing to do. And we're here to help you. We're here to serve you. And that's truly how you bring servant leadership into sports. Yeah, true. No, I definitely Absolutely. agree with you. And I think I saw that with quite a few of the athletes that were using their platform in order to talk about issues that they were concerned about. I think we saw that with a number of the professional athletes when they were talking about things around Black Lives Matter. And I think we've even seen it now when people are using their, their platforms to address issues that are going on with our Asian American uh, brothers and sisters, as well as other folks that are being discriminated against, but they're using the platform that they have, which is that team platform or that athletic platform. But one of the things I was curious about, Kyla, with your situation and everything is, do you feel that, um, you know, this is, we're in the middle, hopefully everybody's getting their vaccine. I know I still got to get mine and all of that, but we're going to hopefully cross the, um, divide that we've been having but a lot of people have not felt that they've been able to do as much training or as much as they would like to do because of the fact that we're all at home working from our computers and doing things of that nature so how were you able or how are you able to even maintain your training when we're in the middle of this pandemic absolutely mark that's such a great question and i just wanted to like tag on to what john was saying everyone wants to be part of something because we're stronger together than we are separately. 
Like we're starting, we're more than we are the sum of our parts. And so everyone wants to be part of something, right? We're all looking for that. And I think that's why teams form. I think that's why we get fantastic fun ri rivalries between football and baseball teams. Like it just, um, we all want to be part of something that we put our heart into. And that's what made this past season, I think in any sport, just heartbreaking right? We have like this, this was my year. 2020 was my year to qualify to go to a world championship in 2021. Everything got canceled. Race after race after race. Races are so much more than just events to go and put it all out on the line. Races are when the community that the triathlon world has built get to come together and party. So there's a, a very special community out there of triathletes. We're called Athenas. We're a, a weight class, but I hate that description. Um, so we're, we're, the, we're the bigger women and we get to race against each other. And we are such a tight knit community and we have people all over the world. And the time that we come together is at races and race after race after race is canceled. And just you think by the fifth time, it's not gonna hurt as much. No, like every single time. And then the world championships got pushed, like everything just, whoo. I have never seen a community stick so tight together than I've seen the triathlete community, but also my team, just the brag on them. Like they just, because there was a shared sadness, a shared grief over just everything being gone. Um, and it was tough and it made every single one of us examine why it is we race. Do we race because it's fun? Do we race because that's the motivation? Do we not care about racing? We care more about training and working out because it keeps us sane. Um, we all went through as a community. There isn't a single triathlete that did not go through figuring out why they do what they do. And I think that's something that John touched on really early on. You have to know why. Right. You got to know why you're doing it. And I had athletes join my team because we were strong. And I was writing training plans and coaching and doing all of this, um, figuring out how to get people to maintain their swim fitness when they can't go to the pool, right? Right. You got to think outside the box for that. How do you have, we saw a lot of virtual races pop up. Everyone's done with virtual races now. We don't ever want to see another one again, but they were fun when they started. Um, I think that when the community is already there, the people who are really there for the community are going to stick around no matter what. The people who are there just because it was trendy or fun or convenient they're the ones who sort of faded away and they'll probably come back when races come back. And there are quite, I live down in Florida. So um, whatever you want to think about, whatever, we kind of never really shut down. So we only had like three months where we weren't really racing. Um, everything's pretty small still, but there is a full calendar of races almost everywhere. Um, and there's a whole set of COVID protocols and everything that race directors are following all this other stuff. So we're all starting to see this glimmer at the end of the tunnel, like you were saying. And, um, there's, again, we're just like, how are we all going to do this? What races are we going to show up at? What directors are we going to support? Where are we putting our money as a community? to keep races alive. And when we talk about um, the servant leadership, you see race directors who are saying, we're, you know, re uh, we're donating all our money to this particular Black Lives Matter movement or this, um, one of the things that have, has started getting a lot of recognition is teaching young black kids how to swim right. because there's just so much that needs to be done in that area. So we, we pick races that are choosing to do good things. And we do that as a community. And, uh, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of power in that. Um, so, you know, doing things because they're right, not because we have to. Um, we're, we're seeing that more and more and more. So um, yes, it's been very tough. 
yes, it's been a wonderful learning experience. And now like, on a very personal level, now 2021 is my year and I get another chance to do it. And they pushed all the world championships. So the one that I still want is just next year instead. It's it's really, it's really lovely. So there's a lot of hope and enthusiasm and joy about that light at the end of the tunnel. So, yeah. Now in the triathlete world, I know that in the other sports, we were just talking about basketball. They went into that whole bubble mentality and everything. So they did it kind of like in that bubble situation where everybody yeah. was protected and all of that. And I think that the NBA for the second year in a row will probably do that in the championship. I know that that's definitely what they did in college ball and definitely have done in a number of other ways also. But is that what we're going to see in the race world as well? Because I'm thinking that throughout yeah. society, we're seeing more and more what I call hybrid events. Like I'm involved yeah. in the film world and have been part of film festivals as well as uh, serve on the board of one of our local theaters. And I know that uh, right Right now, our film festivals have been virtual, but they are talking that by the end of the year, we may be able to go into more of that hybrid environment. So I was just wondering, as both of you are involved in the, the sports world, do you think that that's going to be the new trend in sports that we're going to be pushing toward hybrid events? Or do you actually think that we will be able to get a full audience of people possibly wearing masks, mm. possibly not wearing masks in the, these uh different venues and all, but what is your thoughts about which direction uh, inter, um, entertainment and particularly sports entertainment is going? Is that the way we're heading is hybrid uh, competitions? So it's, it's really interesting that you ask that question. Um, almost. So there's, there's kind of two levels in triathlon, right? There's like the fun people who race we tend to be a little competitive, but we're not professionals. Um, those races these days, almost everyone has a virtual option. So you can register for the race and you do the race at home, right? They have to keep the numbers low because of how much distance we have to keep in the transition area, like all this stuff. Temperature checks, masks required all the way up to the start line. They hand out masks at the finish line. Um, as much contactless like stuff as possible. Your medal is in your packet pickup, like all that stuff, right? Then we have the professional level, right? And here in the U.S., we've had three professional triathlete races since quarantine sort of lifted. There's Challenge Daytona in December, which I had the joy of going to and being a referee. That was incredible. Um, we had uh, Great Floridian. That was in October. I also got to go to that one and referee. And then we just had Challenge Miami, um, which I did not go to. And we talk about sort of making a bubble. Um these are athletes that come from all over the world, right? We had Paula Finley, who comes from Canada. Um, in Challenge Daytona, we had Alistair Brownlee, who came from the UK. We've got a bunch of UK at our US athletes here as well. So they, they create like a little bubble and like they have to have a COVID negative test. They have to do a couple of them. They have temperature checks all the time. Um, and then someone actually tested positive before, um, I think it was before Challenge Miami. And someone else was trying to come in and they hadn't filed their paperwork to come in from, I think, Hawaii. So they weren't allowed to come and race. So on a professional level, they really are trying to go above and beyond um, because it's so much more of an international kind of thing going on. But there is definitely two different levels. So you can't really have a hybrid at the pro level. Um, but there, there's definitely a lot of checks and balances going on in there. When she tested positive, they already had a quarantine hotel set up for her, like a whole process. It was... Um, it was really, really well handled. I mean, it was really sad that she didn't get to race, but it was really well handled as far as that goes. Um, triathlon does not have the money pouring into it like baseball and basketball and cricket and all those other things. So, you know, they do the best they can with what they have. Um, one of the really big things was at Challenge Daytona, there was a $1.2 million purse of money that was on the line because the pros hadn't raced almost all year. They hadn't made any money. So there was a lot of money on the line at that race. And a lot of people were like, rah, rah, rah. I'm like, they haven't raced all year. This is like their one paycheck. Um, so it was very enticing for a lot of pros to come in, um, but they still very much limited. And there were crowds there. They, I mean, it was at like 10% of what it normally is. Um, and it was like mass everywhere, all the stuff. So even at the events, which would you know be like going to games and stuff, um, there was just a lot of safety and a lot of protocols going on. The thing that's come out of it, and maybe both of you know this with sports, is so much live streaming now. 
-hmm. Like you don't live where your team is and there's no blackout stuff of dates or whatever. Now you can just watch any game anywhere pretty much. Everything is live stream. And so that has made the triathlon professional circuit, um, I think a lot more accessible. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that coming in. Cause if you go watch a professional triathlon race, just go watch one, go watch the highlights from Challenge Miami. You'll be hooked. It's so exciting. I mean, I, I, it's so exciting. They're going 25 to 30 miles an hour on their bicycles. They're running six minute miles. It is fast paced. It is incredible. And I'm very, very excited about it. And I will talk about triathlon all day. John, please interrupt me. And <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. You were doing a great job. I was enjoying the conversation. I do have a question that I'm curious about because um, one of the things that I know that was very popular was kind of these contests that are, I mentioned uh, um, like those um, endurance races where you're doing like, um, um, what do you call them? Obstacle courses. That's kind of what my brother was involved in and all of that. Oh, but then there are also the ones that I sometimes wonder how triathletes and other runners feel about these contests because to me, they don't really make much sense. Like I know here in North Carolina, we've got something called the Krispy Kreme Challenge where a lot of folks will run these great races and everything else, but then they're also supposed to eat a lot of Krispy Kreme's donuts and all of that. So it seems to me that that's kind of defeating the purpose. But then you have the other great races like the Great American Race that are there to honor the different uh, causes. Like it might be uh, a race for breast care, breast cancer awareness or a race for diabetes or a race for a number of other things along those lines. So I'm just wondering your thoughts about those specialty races. That's what I call them, especially races. And sometimes the specialty races, like I don't know how you can go running like, you know, 10, 15 miles or however many miles they run and then go eat tons of donuts. But they right. do it. There is a race for anything that you want to do. And now it makes more sense that your brother kept getting injured because those Spartan races, I, I tried one. Mm, no, it was not, it was not for me. Um, the, you know, the donut race thing seems to be a really, really big theme. They have donut cycling races, donut running races. Um, people do them for fun, right? We do them for fun. I did a, a 66 mile bike ride race where for every donut you ate, you got five minutes off your time. It took me eight minutes to eat a donut. They were huge. They were these huge donuts. It took me eight minutes to stop, get off my bike, get a donut, eat it, and get... I was not saving time. And you're right. Like, people train. Just like people train to be professional eaters, right? People train to run and eat donuts, run and drink beer, run and do other things, run and swim and run and swim and run and swim. Takes a special kind of person to eat 10 donuts and run 10 miles, but but people do it. And and people love theme races, they love specialty races. Um, they love the races that donate money to stuff. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of ones that um, honor veterans and the military. There's a great one in Indiana called Leon's Triathlon that is um, really aimed specifically at military and veterans, and they do a lot of fundraising for that. So if you've got a cause, if you've got something you love, there's going to be a race for it. And if you got something that you like doing, like rollerblading, there, there's going to be a race for that. You just got to find it. Your people are out there. Your team is waiting for you. Definitely. What do you think is some of the big mistakes I was talking, and I'd love to hear from both of you, but I'll start with you, Kyla, that people make when they are doing coaching? Because you've coached triathletes, you've coached a number of other folks, but with, I mentioned some of the great coaches that I know about um, here in this area. North Carolina is definitely a basketball center and all of that, but I've also followed uh, football. I remember that I was and still am a big fan of the Minnesota Vikings, so I have a great deal of respect for the legendary coach Bud Grant and a number of other coaches in the football fraternity, including the gentleman from New England. But I was just wondering, what are some of the mistakes that you feel folks make when they are getting involved in coaching that you wish they would not do? Mm. Um, I think the absolute number one mistake you can make as a coach is to not listen to your athlete. Um, I've had a number of people join my team because um, I am authentic and transparent about my struggles as an athlete with mental issues, anxiety, depression, all that stuff, with injury, with all that stuff. I am transparent and people see that. So they know they can come to me if they're trying to train through anxiety. Um, I had a 
person come and join my team who was paying their coach a ridiculous amount of money a month. And all their coach did was make them feel terrible when they had to skip a workout because the anxiety was just too much. When you start putting your own whatever on your athletes, it is a fine line. I think John will agree with me. It's a fine line that you tread between pushing them and pushing them away. But if you really listen, if you understand what their priorities are and you honor those priorities, your athletes are going to love you regardless of whether or not you're good at writing plans or good at doing whatever you're listening and honoring where they come from. And that's the number one mistake I see over and over and over again, not listening. I, I totally agree with you, Kyla, uh, regarding that it's, it's listening to your athletes and that the coach is not the main actor in the story. Yes. yes. <laughs> you know, that that's, you know, and sometimes the media can play that up. But the, yeah. basically, they are a supporting cast to support the athletes in the things that they're doing. There's some. There's a really interesting uh, thing out there. In the uh, Barry Oshry wrote a book called "The Mysteries of Secret Mysteries of Organizational Life," mm -hmm. and basically, uh, he talks about the notion of that in all organizations. And I'll talk about sports right here. We have tops, middles, and bottoms in the stratosphere of of power differentials on teams and 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 if the coach maintains the coach is typically the top of of the food chain right there and then and then the the team captains and seniors and le other team leaders are kind of the middles and then the rest of the team are the bottoms and and bottoms does not mean that that it, that they're bottom feeders at all no mm -hmm. but sometimes coaches treat them as that but the bottom line is coaches understand that the basically the work gets done by the bottoms mm -hmm. and that then when athletes are out there competing, whether in more of an individual or a team sport, okay, they know more about what's going on than anybody does. And if coach listens to them, as Kyla was saying, to bring that up, that's important. Going back to Catherine DiLorenzo, uh, at Middlebury College, uh, she really welcomes her athletes. If they call it, they call a timeout. They come by. Something's not working. She invites and she says to the players, "Well, what are you seeing out there?" And one mm -hmm. of the players may say, "You know, Coach, when we did this against this other team with that same type of structure, it tended to work for us." Thank you, thank you, Gina. That was that was perfect. Let's let's do that as we go back out there. Mm -hmm. But that the athlete matters. The coach listens to the athlete. And that's when the, 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 the top, middle, bottom relationship is empowered when that coach listens to and brings to fore all the things that are going on and that what the athletes have to say. Because if it's not working, okay, if it's not working out there, basically the athletes bind to get bond together and they live in, an, in a world of like we're, we're not listened to, okay? Mm -hmm. the top does – you know, whatever they want to do. And we can see this in business organizations also. Mm -hmm. And one other thing in there too is this, the notion of, of besides listening, it's providing appropriate feedback, giving the right feedback at the right time yes. for the right yes. reason. Yes. So, you know, uh, there's maybe th like three types of feedback. Uh, Doug Stone and Sheila Heen wrote a great book called Thanks for the Feedback. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, Appreciative feedback, we know what that is. It's saying, hey, that's a great job. But you go beyond that's a great job. You say, what what was it about what they did that you so enjoyed? To let them know that, to feed that back to them. Then there's coaching or skill improvement feedback saying, hey, I'm going to coach you up. Then there's a value to feedback saying, okay, this is how well you did. This is how well you didn't do. And so some, sometimes some – Sometimes people don't, the athletes don't care for the evaluative feedback. And the thing is that coaches need to know, is this the right time to give that feedback? Or maybe I should give coaching feedback instead. Or if you mm. give, if you're always going around giving appreciative feedback, everything's great. And the athlete finally says, coach, you got to coach me some more with this. Mm -hmm. So it's finding that sweet spot. Now, does that put more of an onus and responsibility on a coach? Yeah, it does. It does. But the the uh, the bottom line, the the rewards are so much greater because you get to know your athletes more, 
and your athletes really respond to that. Yeah. It sounds to me like you're both saying, and I'd love to hear if I'm hearing you correctly, that the coach, it doesn't matter whether it's a business coach or a athletic coach or any kind of coach that exists out there. I've even got some friends that are health coaches, but they're not just doing the coaching of whatever that field is, but it also sounds like they're also life coaches because it seems to me that the best coaches that I know are the ones that they aren't just friends with that particular person doing that uh, three or four years that they are with that person, assuming that they stay for the duration of their college career and all of that but they are staying friends with them throughout because i've heard of a number of even like nba players that are still in touch with their high school Mm -hmm. or their um college coaches because they had that connection with them as being a life coach and they were giving them advice Mm -hmm. about life things whether that's relationship things that they might have been getting into or finances because a lot of times they are you know coming up with if they become like an NBA or an NFL player a major star that gets major money so then they don't always know how to handle that money but it seems to me that the best coaches are those that are the coaches not just for that moment but they are there to be coaches throughout and they, they build this bond with their athletes that carries them throughout their coaching career. And every time I hear of coaches that are being talked about, like say on ESPN or some of the other uh, sports programming and sports networks, they oftentimes are talking to athletes that are reflecting on the coaches in their life that they might've had in the past and how they are hoping to maintain the relationship with the coach that they currently have. So how important do you think it is for coaches to be life coaches? Hmm. That's such a great question. <laughs> I've had so many athletes tell me, Kyla, you're so much more of a life coach than a triathlon coach. And I'm like, well, I'm just coaching you about your life. It just happens that right now your life is about triathlon or your life is about this. I think it just goes back to listening, right? Like not unless you're unless you're a professional athlete, your life is not about whatever sport you're doing. Right. So my athletes have jobs and families and kids and parents and cars and houses and things they have to deal with that might be more important than getting to the pool. Right. And helping, showing, supporting people how to balance all of the things that are going on and figure out what is really most important right now and who are you putting first. That is a, that's just a key element in being a good coach because you're not always going to be first to your athletes. And, and that can be, you know, an ego, whatever, not for me. Um, But if you help those athletes understand that they should always be first to themselves, because a lot of them don't, they don't think that they think that their kids are first or their job is first once they decide to put themselves first, then it makes it a lot easier to think about that eight hour training day where they're going to be away from everything. Like it's all right to say, I need this time for myself. So, you know, a good coach is a good coach. It's more than just writing a training plan. It's more than just giving someone a business model to follow for their business. It's more than knowing how to run the right kind of drills for softball. It's about helping your athletes balance everything in their life including the sport. And I'd love to hear from both of you, your thoughts, and you actually alluded to it, Kala, about the importance of sports and just uh, sports training and just life in general to psychology. Because I think that's one of the things we talk about here on international broadcast media is the fact that too often we don't spend enough time paying attention to people's um personal psychology and what they're going through and everything. Um, John, you had actually alluded to, and that is actually was one of the moments that touched me as well, seeing that coach actually reach over and talk to their star athlete and, you know, basically letting them know that, you know, this was not the end of the world, that even though I believe that that athlete was a senior, but that they would probably go on to do many other great things. And even though they missed that shot, that it was not going to be the, um, you know, definitely they were going to feel the pain of losing and the pain of what they went through, but it wasn't going to be like um, a overly devastating impact on their overall life. And that's the kind of impression that I got is what she was doing in that comforting moment. And it definitely touched me and everything. And I saw even that some of the combatants were doing the same thing. I mean, I think I saw one of the other nice moments that I saw in the competition between uh, Gonzaga 
and UCLA was how the players actually got together and kind of huddled together, even though they were on opposite teams. And even though one won and the other lost, they were acknowledging each other's presence and what they had just gone through. Because like I, I kind of agree with what Clark Kellogg said, that you know there was no real loser in that game. There was just one team that ran out of time because they were definitely mm-hmm. going to battle. And it's just a matter of one had to move on and the other had to go mm-hmm. and uh, – collect their thoughts and, you know, prepare for the next year or the next season or the next phase of their life if they're a senior and about to graduate. But I was just wondering some of your thoughts about um, the role of psychology in coaching and the role of understanding psychology. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, I see, I see coaches as mentors and the athlete as a mentee, but there's a reciprocal relationship right there. And Kyla, you've probably seen this too, is where we gather so much from what goes on with the athlete. You know, there's a thing called the hot, cold empathy gap. And the thing is that many times coaches who are athletes uh, themselves, and they, they communicate with the, the athlete, but the athlete's in a different space at this time than the coaches. But when the coach mm-hmm. can actually feel and know and understand what it's like to be an athlete today. What was it like for a year not being able to compete? As Kyla's saying, being not being able to, to be in a, in a uh, triathlon competition. And I've worked with a variety of different athletes and teams over the past year where the teams have met and I've met with them on Zoom, you know, yeah. and, and there's so much you can get out of, uh, out of, out of social media with that. Okay. But the bottom line is to psychology is that we, we, we all want to be listened to, as Kyla was saying. We want to feel genuinely needed, okay, mm-hmm. um, and we want to have some sort of meaningful purpose in life. And and uh, when 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 coaches can be able to address that and help to bring that out with their athletes, that's doing the real psychology of it. And you know, some sometimes today, sometimes people will use little you know standard cliches about different sports stuff. It's it goes so much deeper than that. And this is where coaches, the more that they can learn and how they can bring out the best and that they can be lifelong learners will actually bring out the best in their athletes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we, it's, mm, so John, I love that you sort of came in from like a sports psychology perspective as well, which is like really great. Cause I want to attack it from like the mental health side of the psychology yeah, right yeah. so um so mental health huge stigma in this world and i remember the very first time i did a social media post and i talked about how uh some days i don't get out of bed because the depression wins or some days i don't do xyz because the anxiety wins and i talk about the support structure that i've created for myself so when i have those rough days um i know how to sort of pull myself back out of it and things like that and so many people had said thank you for being honest and open about this um and I ended up getting so many athletes who said, oh, good, someone who's going to understand when I say I didn't go on that six mile run because I was in bed under the covers because it was a bad day. Right. So being a coach who understands mental health, regardless of whether or not you've walked that path and have that struggle, but you understand at a, at a just a basic psychology level, what depression, what bipolar, what the autism spectrum is, what anxiety is like, what all of those things, so that you understand, even if it's just in a brain level, what your athletes might be going through. That goes right with that listening, right? Because you're going to know if someone tells you they couldn't do something because they had an anxiety attack, the worst thing you can do is make them feel guilty. The best thing you can do is say, okay, let's try again tomorrow or next week or whenever, right? Especially with this pandemic, we're seeing so many more people identify that they have struggled with some sort of mental illness and the the pandemic really just amplified it. And, you know, of course, a lot of people really did have a lot of depression and things that happened and triggered because of the isolation. Um, But a fair amount of those people actually had a lifelong mental illness that they just never realized what normal looked like. 
So raising the awareness that it's okay to have those things. Hey, and guess what? You can be a phenomenal athlete and a phenomenal human being um, just by having that basic understanding of what that's like for people who struggle with that. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's where that is. Just to, just, just to dovetail on what Kyla was saying, is that even not at a, to a, a total clinical position Thank you. that's the word clinical <laughs> <laughs> is that sometimes sometimes athletes when they have fear and anxiety regarding their performance or they have anger or they have guilt or they feel shame or sadness or disgust um that may not be all the way a clinical concern but it's Absolutely. something that the emotions come out but their belief system okay mm -hmm. is negative and it usually is something that it's not just on the athletic field it's, it's, it's in, as Kyle was saying, it's, it's daily life. Yeah. So, so if, a, if, if an athlete feels is that they're not competent or, you know, they, 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 so they feel fear and, and anxiety because of that. Well, where else do you not feel conf confident, mm -hmm. competent in your life? And usually it's, it's something else that's going on too. And if coaches can be able to, you know, help the athlete go past the emotion and understand what is the what's the thought that's going on there when you don't do well. Now this this is really important and it, it, it's age it needs to be age appropriate too that the that the coach and the athlete have that vulnerability trust with each other. Is that when you know if if you know uh, saying you know I, I I let the team down, you know uh, you know I didn't do it. I missed the last shot. I let the team down. Well, what what, what what's that all about? All about? You know that that you violated somebody else's rights. Now reject that thought. Mm -hmm. Did you really do that, or it was just one play, one moment in time? Yeah. You know, not to define yourself as a per. You know, your be just your behavior at that one moment. Yeah. And how much do you think it is important for uh, coaches to be involved? And I'm actually, I have a bias toward the example I'm going to use in everything. But a lot of times I think that uh, coaches and athletes know that they're in a business relationship and it's definitely a business relationship. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. like the professional athlete and the professional coach and everything. But then, you know, they don't always follow the same protocol as maybe they were expected to get into that business world. I'm actually went to school. Um, we were at Marquette at the same time with Doc Rivers. And I know that he was recently in the news because one of his athletes that was involved in a trade was basically like, you know, Doc could have at least gotten in touch with me and told me about the trade, wish me well and all of that. And I think Doc's attitude was kind of like, you know, I'm concentrating on trying to build the 76ers into a championship quality team. So no, I did not make that call and all of that. So that's kind of the gist of what I heard at everything. And like I said, I did go to school with Doc, so maybe I'm taking a little bit more of his side than the other guy's side. But I was just wondering, how important do you think it is to have that business relationship even in the corporate sports world? Hmm. This might be a John question. Uh, it's it's a really good question. I, I don't know if I had have a, a great answer for that because all coaches are different. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, what is the purpose of professional sports? You know, and uh, and there's so many different other taglines that go around with that there, too. You know, I I am biased in going to the point is that even with business decisions, you still need to cultivate connections. You need to effectively challenge your athletes and you need to give them some level of control mm -hmm. and, and across the whole spectrum. So basically, if an athlete goes to a different team, which means they're they're leaving the company <laughs> and they're right. going to a different company, you yeah. know, uh, the you know, uh, you know, many coaches will, will just say, you know, may they may have that exit interview. But if in your if in the midst of your season and you've got a game the next day with the person that was traded for coming right back in, there may not be time to do that at that moment. Okay. Yeah. And um, and not that the athletes need to have thick skin, but I'm biased to the point as you still want to try to try to communicate a little bit. And this is this is what we've done. It's a business decision. It's not personal. But those are yeah. tough things when we get to the professional levels. Right. Yeah, I definitely. think when you talk about the business relationship of 
I've hired a coach for me, right? Like my athletes pay me money. So I coach them. And if I don't coach them the way they want to be coached, that gets weird, right? So when we're talking about like a business relationship on that sense, like, like I have expectations from the coach that I, I have a very nice, famous swim coach that I pay a fair chunk of money to. So I have expectations <laughs> about how he's going to coach me because I pay him a lot of money. And he is a professional. He coaches Olympians. So maybe I got to let myself take a back seat and let him coach the way he's best. Co like, he, there's a reason why I'm paying him a lot of money. There's a reason why he has Olympians that he coaches, right? So that kind of business relationship is also very interesting. Like I'm paying you money for a service. You better give me what I want. You might not like the way that I coach. You are free to go find another coach in that sense. Um, so it, it does get a little, um, I I've had it get a little weird, but fortunately with only one athlete. And I was like, look, there's other coaches and there's lots of other coaches and if you don't like what you're getting from me, then that's fine. You can go find another company to work for, right? Like, so it's interesting on like a, on a team level. And this is Mark, you put together, John is an amazing person because it sounds like you have a lot of team coaching expertise. At the very least, you know a lot about sports teams and coaching. And I have a lot of individual coaching experience. So it's really like two different worlds and I'm learning a ton from John. So like, Thank you for putting together a great pair of people. But um, it's still that same dynamic, right? Of I'm paying you a lot of money to do something. And if you're not going to do what I want to do, then you know, we talk about like the Anaheim Mighty Ducks as a hockey team, right? Mm -hmm. They were a bonus add-on for Disney to make more money. That's how they started. No one ever expected that they'd win their league. No one ever expected they'd go to the Stanley Cup, like anything like that, because they were a Mickey Mouse team to make extra money for Disney, right? You got the LA Kings right next door, a serious, legit NHL team. I'm talking like 10 or 15 years ago. I'm probably dating myself, but um, maybe, maybe even, maybe even 12, oh my gosh, like 20 years ago. Um, and then they became a great team. Because they didn't care. Those coaches didn't care what they were being paid for. They wanted to coach a winning team. And the athletes wanted to be winners. That's their job, right? So it's really interesting how even though the boss says one thing, all the other people, you know, they can sort of take over and, and do what they want, if that makes sense. But go if you don't know about the history of the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, go, go read it. It's a fascinating, fascinating uh, story. So it's like the one bit of sports I know is hockey. <laughs> so well, we actually had hockey down here, even in the Carolinas, and they actually did pretty well a couple of times, and we'll see what they do this time. But the Hurricanes Who actually – Who are the Stanley Cup champions? <laughs> Who are the Stanley Cup champions? The Tampa Bay. That's Tampa, right, Tampa Bay. Florida. Yep, Florida. Tampa Bay. Florida is the Stanley Cup champions. People are rolling. Canada cannot take it. How? They're like, how do you even have ice? I'm like, look science that's how we have ice right like they're not even my team i don't i mean tampa bay they're a great team but it's like yeah it's all over now it's all over the place yeah, it's all over the place and i know that uh, one of our producers here he's hoping that he can get cricket to go all over the place but i'm like that's a long game i don't know if that's ever going to yeah. happen because that game takes a way much too long but i know that anki one of our producers is always trying to get us to understand the wonders of cricket and how it's an amazing sport and i'm not arguing with him on that but it just seems like too long, and I don't know that it will yeah. ever catch on as an American sport. Is there any sport that you think will catch on that we haven't had catch on yet? Because um, I know some people were hoping that lacrosse would catch on. And, of course, there's that push for soccer, even though it hasn't quite caught on as much as some of the soccer folks would like. But is there a sport out there that you do think will has a hope of being the new sport at some point or another? Either one mm. of you. Well, I, I'm kind of biased because I was a lacrosse goalie and I had coached lacrosse for many years. And now there were two professional lacrosse leagues called one called Major League Lacrosse, another called Pre, the Premier Lacrosse League. And basically, the they they basically merged now, and now we just have the profession the uh, Premier Lacrosse League. And basically, they don't they're in that PLL they don't have any home fields. 
they don't have a home team. They travel huh. during the summertime with all eight, I believe maybe seven or eight teams now, they'll travel from venue to venue. And they've they've got a great social media following and they'll get wow. that. And that that's that's really that's really been a very interesting way to kind of make the shift, you know, from yeah. from having your, you know, people kind of being, you know, nationalistic and having their own home teams there. You can have your team now, but you're going to see that, you know, with uh, they've got some rights with NBC and ESPN and, you know, et, et cetera, like that. So I see that as, as coming along there. I, 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 you know, from a, from a, 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 that, that perspective, I think with lacrosse is, is really kind of making a, a strong, a strong uh, charge now as the next board. Yeah. yeah. I think there's two exciting things going on, right? One break dancing at the Olympics. Yes. So cool. <laughs> uh, like elevating that to the level of sport. That's really cool to me. Yeah. Um, the thing that I wish would become huge is artistic swimming, which they used to call synchronized swimming, but now right. they call it artistic swimming for whatever reason. Um, the U.S. has a phenomenal team. Oh my goodness, they're incredible. And you're starting to see all the other teams around the world. Um, we're starting to devote resources to them and coaching and time and money and all this other stuff. I would really love to see that take off because the physicality, the mentalness, the team spirit, like it, it puts basketball to shame. It put like it's everyone in motion and the same thing. And if you get off, you get kicked in the face. Like, ooh, artistic swimming. I would love to see that take off. It's just, and there's a lot of movements to start it in um, where there's already like swim teams with young swimmers is to say, hey, come over here and try this because they've already got some of the physicality. They've got some of the breath work that's going. And so if you get them when they're middle teens, early 20s um you can really start to develop that i'd really love to see that take off it would just it would be so much fun to see yeah i can, I can agree with that but i'm also a big fan and my cousin played it a couple of times um just <clears throat> recreationally i don't think he played it um competitively or anything along those lines but i've been a big fan for a while of soccer and i would love to see soccer oh, take yeah. off and everything but i don't know why soccer hasn't quite taken off and even in like our big cities and all of that. So I'd love to hear. Well, you talked process. about, you talked about how cricket is a long game, right? Yes. Yes. Soccer is a long game and it rarely ends when it's supposed to end. It can end whenever they want it to end. Um, and I, I think that's why it, it really hasn't taken off. We'll be very clear in the U S the rest right. of the world is crazy for soccer. I mean, just, they love it. They absolutely love it. But I think along with sort of the lines of cricket, I think that um, even though soccer is very fast moving, it's whatever, it's a longer game. And um, if you want to fall in love with soccer, go watch Ted Lasso, which is on Apple TV plus. It's a phenomenal show. It's about British soccer, but it's, um, it's still, it's still really great. You get to learn a little bit of how it works in Britain, but I think it's cause it's a longer game. I think it's um, the rules are a little bit, weird comparatively to the things that we know um and and the whole idea that it you never know when it's going to end like just i think that baffles our minds as americans a little bit so yeah i yeah. can see that and everything one of the things that i know that the network talks about all the time is this concept of education and mm -hmm. within education they oftentimes talk about financial literacy and a number of other things that go on in our education system but i know that one of their famous quotes is that we are in the 21st century but we're going by 18th century values i would argue the same thing with our sports programming in the sense of like the way that we teach health and sports in the school system and all of that but i was just wondering do you feel that there's enough push for not so much the competitive side because i think that that we're doing all right at every high school every junior high they've got their teams they're competing and everything but in the day-to-day the -day teaching of health and of um sports in general because i remember um going to school in uh the 70s and definitely you were required to take certain health courses that might involve running and having that exercise time i don't mm -hmm. know i don't have any kids of my own but i don't know that my two nephews 
have that kind of exercise time except for that that they create themselves. And they do belong to outside clubs, but I don't know that they get enough of that in the school system. So do you think that we as a society, meaning American society, are doing a good enough job of encouraging sports and athleticism and definitely health within our school system? Well, I, I think in, in some ways with uh, academic competencies being so strong, it is kind of in some ways left some of um, the health education pieces out, right. you know, mm-hmm. but if, if a school system, if school districts really say that they're, they educate the whole child or the mm-hmm. whole person, then you have to look at that whole person. And I, I look from a standpoint of looking at, you know, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the moral, mm-hmm. the social, and the spiritual. And I mean the spiritual from a standpoint of purpose and meaning. Yeah. And that and that I think some of our best teachers in our schools are in some ways really good health educators because they bring out the best in their students. But formalized curriculum done well, okay, is is really important. And sometimes it actually gets short shrifted, you know, along with our, our physical education programs, yeah. you know, and um, so it doesn't necessarily always bring out the best in young people. And so if yeah. we're really talking about looking at that whole person, we want to talk about that behavior. We want to talk yeah. about about how 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 young people think about their, their own health and what they need to do, because there's so many educators for health behavior out there that we see, whether it's through advertisements on TV and a variety of other things, that, that, that the school becomes a really fertile ground when accepted and, uh, and that schools promote uh, good health behavior and good health education. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, it's been a long time since I was in high school. But I do remember you only had to take a year of phys ed. In middle school, they they make you slog through it and it's horrible and like no one likes it except the kids who are super naturally physically fit and you have to do all this. Like, I think we learned how to dance at one point. Like it was, but when we talk about being stuck in the 1800s um, and we talk about health, if we continue to use BMI, body mass index, as an indicator of health, and we continue to just hammer that into the heads of our young people, we are leading them towards unhealthy lives. Like, and that's the thing. We, you, I think they still use those little fat pension caliper things to decide whether or not you're healthy. I'm like, are you kidding me? So as long as we continue to perpetuate this terrible, terrible notion that you got to be super skinny and thin and have a BMI of whatever and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're, we're doing a disservice to health, right? You see the chunky girl and you think, oh, no, she can't do any of that. No, she's going to kick your butt in the pool because she like she's got she's not fat. She's muscular, right? We talk about how there's super famous athletes who are at the top of their game and super fit. And you look at their BMI and it's obese or morbidly obese because they're short and muscular or because they're tall and just big bones and muscles and all this other stuff. So the thing is uh, living in the 1800s, if we continue to perpetuate the idea that size equals health, we're just, we're going to ruin an entire, another entire generation of young people um, and really going out of our way to make sure that movement and sport are available to every single kid, no matter what, like then, like that's, that'll be a huge step too. An absolutely huge step. Oh, no doubt about that. <clears throat> As you were saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, I was thinking to myself that um, I don't know their BMI, but I imagine that Venus Williams and Serena Williams can have the greatest BMI in the world. Cause they are actually, and when I look at them, they look fairly uh, I mean, they're definitely athletic, but they also would, I guess some people would consider stocky. Yes. We call them, um, some people call them thick or curvy or voluptuous, but I will tell you a lot of what's under that is muscle. You go look at their, their quads and their calves. What? That's how they get that explosive energy for tennis. Those arms, pow. I mean, they're just, they're incredible. And they're a really, really great example, along with many other female sports 
people that whatever you think the ideal body type is for an athlete, you're probably wrong because we have women at the top of their game who've had children, <laughs> who are pregnant, who are fatter than you think it should be, who are just like just killing it. They're just doing an amazing job. So, uh, just- so that's one of the things I was talking to John about before you joined and everything. And I would love to know your thoughts about the coach of the uh, Arizona team that decided that she was going to both coach and breastfeed her uh, child at the same time that she was doing all of this great coaching and everything. But I would love to hear your perception of that because I do know that there were some people, and I love what the commentator said, one of the sports commentators, as they were given the details of what she was going through in order to, mm-hmm. prepare, to prepare the milk for her child was mm-hmm. like, if you think that this is too much information, then we need to get past this and everything. Right. And what she said, but I couldn't have agreed with her more and all of that, but I would love to know. So your here, Here's what's so interesting. What have John and I been talking about? Athletes are more than just athletes. Coaches right. are more than just coaches. We have kids, we have families, we have jobs. Yeah. Her job at that moment is to be a coach. And guess what? Her job at that moment is also to make sure her child gets enough food to develop properly. So what are you going to do? You're going to breastfeed when you need to. You're going to pump when you need to. Women don't have that choice. We can't just be like, hey, come back in 30 minutes. That's not how it works. (laughs) And especially we talk about like the emotion thing that happens. You know, there's, there's that whole thing that I don't know much about, but I do, I have had friends who have kids and they'll be talking about something that's very emotional and just it'll flow. Cause that's just how it is. Um, there's a, a, and I cannot remember her name and I hate that. I can't remember it. An ultra distance runner who was doing like a, like a hundred mile run or something like that. Right. Who had to stop at least twice to pump for her child because she had, her kid was like six or seven months old. She had to pump for them because you have, that has to come out or it's like, you're going to have issues. So she had planned that into her race to be able to do that. Not only to be able to feed her child, cause she was out running for like, I want to say like 28 or 29 hours, but like her kid needed, needed to eat at that time too. So like, yeah, normalize the idea that women have children and that the way those children get raised is by feeding them. And for many women choosing to breastfeed your child, like that's, that's your choice. Like, yeah. So I, I, re- I do remember hearing a little bit about that. And I was like, yeah, like people need to get over it if they can't deal with it. Do they think that they, they were once babies too, right? Like their mamas took care of them too. So yeah, I think it's awesome. Yeah, I thought it was an awesome thing that was going on in that particular situation. One of the things that you oftentimes hear people talk about with athletes is the fact that it is a um, very small minority that actually make it to the professional level. So a lot of times people will talk about the fact that, you know, it's a lot of people that are doing it in high school, on the college level, but only a select few are going to make it into the professional level. And that maybe there's an over-concentration on that part of sports and everything because not everybody is going to be a LeBron James and be able to make that kind of money that LeBron makes or that um, Seth Curry makes or a number of other great athletes make in that regard. So what do you say to those that might think that we have over-commercialized and maybe even unrealistically over-commercialized the chances of folks have to be a professional athlete. Because like I said, we want uh, the top athletes and we definitely want folks to be there providing us that entertainment, whether it's the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, or a number of other leagues, even the Olympics and all. But that's a small fraternity that is, um, you know, it's not as wide as we would like to think. And sometimes too often, too many people in our minority communities and in our uh, like lower income communities, they see that and entertainment as their only way out and don't necessarily mm-hmm. concentrate on some of the other ways out as well. So when you're as a coach, when you're seeing folks that are have potential, but maybe they don't have the potential to be at the next level, what are some of the words of encouragement that you give them to continue pursuing their dream, but also look at other opportunities? I think it's about looking at the process of everything, you Mm -hmm. know, um, 
as you said, Mark and Kyle would probably agree that certain people can be an, a, a professional Olympic triathlete. I mean, and then um, the same thing in, 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 in team sports too. Uh, I'm, I'm working currently working with some individuals who are, are uh, you know, potential Olympians and they have uh, they're in the, they have a variety of different factors that are really going for them. Okay. Uh, but for that, I'm working, you know, with a variety of different athletes who, who aren't going to get there um, and, and getting them, it's important over time to, to be realistic. And one of the things that's really important where at many times that um, some athletes and, and uh, start kind of specializing in sports mm-hmm. at younger and younger ages. Mm-hmm. And then, and, and in some ways after a while, and I was on a, uh, a show with Dr. Andrew Jacobs yesterday out of uh, Kansas city, Missouri, he's a sports psychologist talking about the notion of, that some kids are ready to retire from active sport at the age of 13 or 14, you know, and many people have heard this before, but it's true. It's because they've had so many games and matches Mm -hmm. and they're just, they're just getting tired of that there. And so the idea is that looking by and getting athletes to look at what is the purpose of why they do what they do. Okay. And how can they enjoy the process? And at the same time, looking, if they're looking for that brass ring, what is going on in the middle where they can be present in the moment to really enjoy moment by moment, you know, uh, practices, races, games, and stuff like that so they can bring out the best in themselves as to kind of deferring all that, you know, that, 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 that good stuff until they, they kind of get to another level. And I think it's really important that we, we share that with, with athletes in there. Mm-hmm. You, know, um, you know, we don't want to burst their bubble whatsoever, right. okay? and, and that's important uh, not to do. But we also have to look at where they are in, in areas that they've, they've mm-hmm. gone to. I, I work with a variety of, uh, of, of hockey, uh, ice hockey, uh, male ice hockey players who've gone through the junior level, then through college, and there's a realization through that process whether they're going to go any further or not with that. It usually kind of shows up after a while. And there's a grief process that goes through that. There's a sense of loss. But as a coach, you are there for that athlete to help them through that process, you know, to help them move forward. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. John John gets it just absolutely right. Um Oh my gosh, train of thought. Um, when I, so I always have my athletes set goals for their races, right? Sometimes their goal is just finish, which is fine. The majority of them, it's finish. Um, a lot of them, it's finish before the cutoff. Um, some of them, I have two athletes specifically that were chasing podiums, right? One of the really nice things I think in triathlon is, um, you can go to a bunch of different races and you can win in your age group. You can win in Athena. You can win in veteran. You can win in newbie. There's lots of different places where you can try and get on the podium. Um, and, and that's sort of for two of my athletes, that's what they were chasing. And that is a really different goal and, and path to that goal than just finishing. Because the biggest thing is you only race against yourself. It's you versus the course, right? When we talk about team sports, it's a little bit different, right? Especially when we get to sort of that professional level. Um, But it's you versus the course. And if you race against anyone else, you're always going to lose. Now, if your goal is to become the national champion, okay, we're going to try our best. And we're going to have a big talk about what happens if that doesn't happen, Um, And so it's a really different kind of training when someone wants to uh, wants to win. And the thing with professional triathletes to make that next big step up, the same with like Olympic swimmers or professional cyclists or like you want to win the Boston Marathon. Those athletes start at a younger age. They're not going to hire a coach like me because I don't have those credentials yet. Um, they're, they're going to be with a coach who's already taken that path, right? So if they don't hit those marks, if they don't get first place at Boston, their coach is like, and here's what we're going to do with this, right? Here's how we're going to turn this around. Like, you know, you're done with ice hockey in college. That's great. How are we going to turn all of this experience and time 
that you've spent doing all of this into something useful. And that's where a good coach is really going to help that kid's trajectory. Um, the role of professional sports in this, yes, we throw tons of money at it, right? But how many kids see LeBron James, Michael Jordan from my generation, uh, Gwen Jorgensen, who is the first U.S. Women to win, woman to win gold in Olympic triathlon? So many people see those athletes, those professional athletes, and think, I'm just going to keep trying. Because if they can do it, and I see that they can do it, and they look like me, I know I've got a shot. And they keep trying. The only thing that we can hope is that they run into a coach or an adult or a leader who, when they miss the mark, says, what are we going to do with this experience that you've had now? Right? You didn't get recruited to go play on the Mighty Ducks. What are we going to do with your four years of college, your four years of high school, and your four years of peewee hockey to, to get your life into a place where you're doing something that you love, right? That's really all that we can hope for because money in professional sports and the glamorization of professional athletes, it's not going away. It's, yeah. it's not. I know. I, I'm just to go off with Kyler. What what you're saying, Kyler, is so true. Uh, I I work with a uh, Division One um, college men's swimming and diving team, and their coach is all about hitting the sweet spot of, you know, doing well competitively, yeah. but also at the same time building the life skills. And mm. part of his job, he believes, part of his job is that he gets ready. He's readying these athletes for when they get out of college for their yeah. next steps in there. They're going exactly, you know, what, what you were saying in there. And I believe part of that is to, I think, hitting the sweet spot of trying to be in present moment mm -hmm. in everything that you do out there. And that's so hard and so challenging to do yeah. is it, to, is to allow yourself if, if you're in a race, okay, or in a game or in a practice, to be really focusing, to be not judgmental, to focus on what you need to do right now at the right moment for the right reason. And if mm. you're able to do that more so, you enjoy that whole process yeah. as opposed to thinking, well, what if and what's going to happen next week and what's going to happen there? And, and going back to the question that you had, Mark, about uh, how with health education in schools, the idea of helping our kids to be more mindful overall. Okay. It's yeah. really, really important. It's, it's yeah. tough there. And COVID, no. COVID yeah. has had maybe the kids going to kind of feel like a squirrel that you're going around back and back and forth and stuff like that, as opposed yeah. to they slow down. Okay. What do I need to do right now to enjoy the process? Yeah. That's yeah. why I think just like application apps like Headspace are so important and powerful mm -hmm. to get people to actually slow the process down really enjoy and smell the roses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely have to smell those roses and everything. No doubt about that. One of the things that I know that I've got an uncle who's, um, he's a multi, multiple stroke survivor. So right now he's uh, definitely dealing with a lot of health issues and everything, but he was an avid golfer. Um, doesn't do the golfing now because of his health issues, but when he was an avid golfer, he competed on those aid circuits. And I know that that's one of the mm. reasons that he stayed so active before, uh, getting caught up in these health issues that he has now was because he was able to compete, like you were saying, Kyla, at different levels. So like I said, he was competing with folks yeah. that were similar to his age and all of that. And I want to say Uncle Randy is in his 80s now, but I remember him competing definitely in his, uh, I want to say, as far as the 60s and 70s in some of those uh, competitions oh, and yeah. everything as a golfer. But, you know, they were aged uh, bracket divided. So he wasn't necessarily competing with like the 20 year old yeah. golfer or something yeah. like that. So that, I think that that was one of those examples. Golf is definitely one of those examples where they do it yeah. by age bracket and you can definitely uh, mm -hmm. have different levels of competition, whether it's by age yeah. or whether it's by um, abilities. Cause I'm sure there are some kind of uh, ways that they um, accommodate people of different abilities if they mm -hmm. are handicapped in one form or or another and not just a golf handicap but like a physical right. handicap as well but definitely that's something that i know exists out there so i agree with you on that 
one of the other things that I know one of my relatives did was a cousin of mine, and I'd love to hear both of your thoughts about this, is that um, a lot of times, you know, we love being coaches, whether it's a coach of life or a coach of people and everything, but then you get to go up in the position and you get to be something bigger than a coach. So I remember he was a coach and an assistant coach on the high school level, and then at some point he had to become – a, or was appointed an athletic director for his high school. And I remember that that became kind of an issue because, you know, coaches like to coach and they like to coach no matter what's going on. So I believe his principal had to tell him that, you know, he did not get the right to coach his coach and all of that. You know, he needed to let the coach do the coaching and he mm-hmm. needed to handle the administrative side of things because that's what an athletic director does. But he was definitely there for a minute, particularly in sports that he enjoyed, like football. Uh, I think there for a minute he was tempted to be the coach in the uh, in the stands. That's right, because that director is probably in the stands versus mm-hmm. on the field. So he was tempted to be the coach on the, the uh, up there in the stands versus the uh, actual coach. So when you have coaches that then go into other positions, maybe they go to the front office or maybe they go and do something else within the administration, whether that's a professional level or on an individual level, what is some of the advice that you give them to let them understand that they have a new role and therefore they don't need to be trying to do their old role with the person that they hired for that role? I I think somebody once told me that being an athletic director is like setting a dinner party every day for 35 different coaches. And it's like setting the table, getting everything else ready for that. Um, uh, and that be, by being a great coach doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a great athletic administrator. And I think what's really important is that the athletic director or program director has the capacity to be able to coach coaches, mm-hmm. to be able mm-hmm. to hold the line there too. And I think it's critical that, that, that with athletic programs that core values are set and the mission mm-hmm. is set within the organization as a whole, you know, so that so that the the basically now the athletic director becomes that top that I was talking about. Right. But they're they're a bottom to somebody else, the school board or the principal or head of school or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then and that they're able to communicate to bring out their best in their coaches. But also mm-hmm. the importance of holding the line right there. Mm-hmm. And the thing is also to cultivate the connections to effectively challenge coaches by providing them the appropriate feedback. And third is that, as I've said before, as coaches can do this with athletes, ADs can do this with their coaches of giving the autonomy support of letting go of control and allowing the coaches to coach, but to do so in a way that their coach, the coach's work is done in the spirit of the school values in the Mm -hmm. program's mission. That's really, really important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's um it's interesting because it uh it brings to mind the adage just because you're really good at math doesn't mean you should be a math teacher, right? So being an athletic director, you might be the greatest coach in the world, but if you can't stay organized, you're not going to be a great athletic director. So if you like being a coach and that's what you're really good at, be a coach. Stay a coach. I really love being a coach and uh, almost everything I do is to make me a better coach. I became a referee so I better understand the rules, how races are run, so I could make lots of connections in the racing world, so I get to go into professional races and meet my heroes, Um, but to be a better coach. And in that, in part of being a referee, they're like, oh, well, we need people to help teach rules to the new officials. Hi, I'd like to do that because I really like teaching and coaching. And I really want to make sure that people have a good experience. Now, do I want to write the rules? No. Do I want to be the person who is the head of all the other referees at a race? No, because I do not want to deal with that administration. I just want to be the person writing penalties. I just want to be a really good coach. At some point, my team will be big enough that I will have a swim specialist, a bike specialist, a run specialist, but I will still be the coach, even though I'll also be sort of a little bit of an administrator. I will still be the coach to my athletes. 
And I do not desire to be anything else because I'm really good at coaching and I really love it. So if someone asks you to be the athletic director and you're not good at it, this is my advice. Don't take the job. <laughs> like if you're going to be the head coach of a bunch of other coaches, like John was saying, and you're going to coach other coaches. Yeah, go for that. Especially if like, that's what you really want. But if someone asks you to do something, just because you're really good at math doesn't mean you should be a math teacher. Yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> now, that makes a lot of sense and everything. Um, I have to ask you because I know that in team sports, the referee is definitely the one that gets a lot of abuse and a lot of uh, neglect and all of that. Is it the same case in individual <laughs> sports like the triathlete? So does the referee get as much abuse as the referee gets in, say, a baseball game or in a basketball game? Oh, my gosh. It's such a great question. Um. So as part of USA Triathlon, which is like the governing body of all the triathlon stuff and the person who sends out all the referees and things like that, um, we very much are there to educate athletes, right? We walk around, transition at the beginning of the race. We answer questions. If we spot something that might be a problem later, we might tell an athlete, hey, just so you know, X, Y, Z, right? Um, Once we're out on the race field, the race field, the race course, that's more referees. And here's what's really, really great about being a referee. It's anonymous. If you're riding on the back of a motorcycle, riding up bike penalties, you've got a helmet, pants, a shirt, a jet. They don't know who you are. So when you write up all the penalties, the head official is the one who posts them. And if an athlete has a problem with that, they go to the head official. That's why I don't want to be a head official. I just want to be a regular official. So uh, it's fantastic because at challenge daytona someone gave alistair brownlee olympic medal winning alistair brownlee someone gave him a bike penalty and he had a really rough run and he ended up just sort of dropping out of the race realized it really wasn't worth it like because he got the penalty i don't know no one will tell me 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 no one will tell me who wrote that penalty no one knows the referee that wrote that penalty Right. So there's a lot of anonymity that comes with that, a lot of protection. Um, we are really trying to be the, the friendly face of the rules. Right. That's really where we're trying to be as an official's um, thing. Do people get angry? Absolutely. Especially if they think we made the wrong call or we're being jerks or we're getting in the way or whatever. Yeah. People get angry. But it's not like at a baseball game or a football game where they're just like, you know, they're just treating them terribly. And man, do I hate that? Not just even before I was a ref. I was like, come on, they're just doing their job. But um, yeah, no, we don't, we don't, we don't get a lot of, a lot of tomatoes thrown at us. Well, that's good to know. I was actually, John, I was picturing um, somebody just handing uh, LeBron James a note saying that he had a penalty (laughs) as opposed to like actually having the physical call. (laughs) Picturing like, you know, just like a note handed off to LeBron James or to uh, Paul Pierce or somebody (laughs) saying, I'm sorry, that was the card. (laughs) Just like a little, a little note. Excuse me, Mr. James. Yeah, you have a two minute penalty. <laughs> I had no idea who it was from. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I think that might be a little guess. We might have to change the rules and everything. One of the things that I was curious about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, John, is, and it comes back to teen sports, is definitely within teen sports, I'm a big fan of minor league baseball, probably because the Durham Bulls are here and all of that. And, of course, those folks are going through the process of getting to the shelf. They're going <clears throat> through the process of making it to the big time and all of that. But um, a lot of the other sports don't necessarily have that as much as they could have it the way that baseball does. Because baseball, you've got everything from the different A's all the way up to you make it to the majors and everything. I think that to some degree, kind of these uh, um, D leagues and stuff like that have become that for the NBA. But I don't know necessarily, even though there have been attempts to do it, that we've really had a true minor league for the NFL and for some of the other sports. So what is your thoughts? Do you think that we do a good enough job of developing even our minor league programs, both in baseball and in basketball. And do you think there's room to develop minor league programming in football and some of the other sports are out there, maybe even your beloved lacrosse? Well, I think in many ways, the minor leagues to, to professional football is, is, is is the college game. Right. You know, it really, really helps athletes to get there. And I think, 
once that athlete, if that athlete can make that transition over there, then what are the responsibilities of the NFL for that athlete too? As you know, even though they're they're getting paid money to do this, but what is the responsibility for the the league to do that? I mean, I think the same thing like with lacrosse, the minor leagues are are the college game, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of gets you you know, to, to get to that point before you go to the, to the professional level in there, you know, and then as you're talking about the D leagues and stuff like that, where that's a chance where athletes can, you know, basketball players can get noticed. And I I think that that's, that's important too, but Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm biased to where, you know, what, you know, what, what can the athlete do for the pro league, but what can the pro league do for the athlete to bring out the best in them as a human being? Well, that actually, yeah, because that actually raises a question that I know a lot of people are thinking about even to this day, which is maybe at some point we need to figure out a way to actually officially, even though they might be unofficially getting compensated, compensate those college athletes if they're going to be going into the pros anyway, or at least some of them are. And maybe, like we said, not a large percentage, but I do wonder your thoughts about that because I know there's been a push to try to have athletes, particularly college athletes, be allowed to get some sort of compensation because in a lot of ways it is their training ground. That's that's a really good question, and I'm still working on the answer for that. I'm going to be very judicious about this. I just know, you know, one thing: if an athlete is on a full scholarship, athletic scholarship, you know, their their their, their four years of eligibility is being paid for by by the college. Mm-hmm. I mean, and what does that what does that do? And then then the other question. So I think I'm answering this by asking more questions. The second question, the second piece is. You know, if an athlete is, um, you know, if an athlete is compensated, what does that do to the the athlete in their team connection in there? You know, as does the athlete, you know, is the athlete promoting him or herself, or is being promoted by an agent for him or herself? And at the same time, what does that do for the overall uh, team concept that we see at the college level? And I think those are questions the NCAA is is looking at right now, to 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 look to see to see those things. So I'm going to I'm going to opt out a little bit on that because I'm just not sure. You know, I think I think you know I'm not sure if there's a sweet spot and how that might be hit with those areas. No, and I think that they're definitely looking at it. And even coming back to Cal and the triathletes and everything, I know that that's also been an issue within quote unquote amateur sports like the Olympics, where a number of folks are trying to figure out how they can balance whatever pay that they are getting with the fact that they are quote unquote amateur athletes. So it does seem like there is a fine line between the quote unquote amateur athlete and the professional athlete. And I'm sure that you've run across that with the triathletes because I know that definitely that's come up in bicycling, which is one of the triathlete sports, but I'm thinking more of like the professional bicycling and the oh, Olympic yeah. bicycling. And definitely we've seen it in other sports that are Olympic sports as well, even track and field. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very, the whole idea of paying, paying athletes, right. Athletes making money off of being athletes. Um, it's just so different across the whole spectrum. Right. And, and you look at some sports that aren't as popular where the way people get paid is they get sponsorships. So their bike, their helmet, their shoes, their food, their gear, their whatever, um, gets paid for by that company and they rep that company. Right. So it's, um, it's, it's a very interesting thing and I'm going to be very interested to see how it plays out as John was saying in the NCAA. Cause you do, you have kids who are on a full scholarship, so they're getting compensation, right? But you also have athletes that aren't on a full scholarship that are, you know, so it, it, it it's all very interesting and seeing how it's all going to play out. I think what happens with the NCAA will trickle down or spread out to the other sports as well, as far as um, how we deal with amateurs and things like that. Um, so I, I think that that's really a uh, an indicator of, of what may happen. And that's a really clever way of uh, saying what John said, which is not really having an answer because we don't really know 
what's going to happen. Yep. Definitely <laughs> wanted to say, by the way, Tim Sohn, who's one of the uh, friends of the show, he was popping in and saying hello to all of us, but he is a longtime fan and a longtime watcher, but he's actually in Pennsylvania. So he's actually oftentimes watching and making comments from the Pennsylvania mm-hmm. area. I know we're going to wind down and everything, but I definitely wanted folks to have an opportunity to learn more about uh, your individual efforts that y'all are involved in. And there's a question I ask everybody pretty much toward the end of all of my interviews. That's a very basic question and everything, but any of the social media that folks can reach out to you and any of the things that you would like to share with our audience in general, now is the time to do that. And then I'll get to that one overall question that I ask all my guests, no matter what field they're in. Well, I'm, I'm just Mark, really excited to be on, uh, uh, your show this week, and, and also a treat to meet you, Kyla. This has been wonderful. Same, uh, same. Where, you know, the three of us kind of going back and forth with this. I'm, I'm really excited because this week um, I launched my book, uh, The Coaching Zone, Next Level Leadership in, in Sports. And it actual, it's on Amazon right now. And on uh, Thursday is our, our, our actual launch day. So you can get the, the book at a highly reduced rate for that day on Kindle. So I'm doing <laughs> famous promotion here. But nice. the book really, really addresses some of the things that I've talked about today, uh, you know, and, and basically looking at the role of coaches in there. And I think what differentiates it's the book differentiated from other coaching books is it goes past the X's and O's and really looks at the coaching. You know, what, what is it to be a coach, the purpose, the shortcomings, the strengths and, the, and stories that coaches have there, too. So you can reach me at, at John at Jaeger leadership.com. That's, that's one word in there. And also our, our the book's website, which is www.thecoachingzonebook.com. So those are um, several different ways and love, love to chat with you and to support anybody else, uh, anybody out there who's, who's in coaching and to, uh, you know, just really, you know, a lot of gratitude for having an opportunity to share some of my thoughts and listening to both of you on today's show. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem at all. Definitely enjoyed having you on. What is some, just really quickly, what are some of the things that within that book that we have not talked about that shocks you? Because I know whenever I talk to authors, there are sometimes some things that they find out as they're writing these books that they were not expected. There's always that hidden nugget. So what was, what would you say is a hidden nugget that folks can look for in the book that shocked you even as you were doing the book? I think the stories I interviewed around 50 different sports psychologists and coaches out there and to find the similarities among their stories, their narratives mm. of really what got them to that point. And it really helped to kind of seal the deal of really looking at the important non-negotiables for coaches to be really effective with their athletes. Yep, yeah, definitely. And what do you think some of those non-negotiables are really quickly for the um, coach to have that, uh, that you found to be like a common non-negotiable? One is that they have to cultivate the connections, you know, through trust, mm-hmm. empathy, and mattering. They need to mm-hmm. challenge athletes by giving appropriate feedback. And uh, they also need to let go of control. Yep. To a certain degree. And that, that difference between youth and professional. But to know what that sweet spot is, is, is really, really important. Now, I can definitely agree with that. Um, before I get to Kyla, and I definitely want to hear what kyla has got going on, what kind of things she's got going on in her life, and things that she's got going with the whole things that are going on in her world. But I was going to share a story with y'all that y'all will both get a kick out of, which is that my nephew, I tell you, I have two nephews, but this was probably five or six years ago and they were involved in competitive soccer. So they were involved in competitive soccer and they were in the middle of a competition. And uh, I can't remember was it the oldest one, Julius or Langston, the younger one, but they were just having a good old time and they were just going you know, all involved, all engaged in the game and everything. And then um, at the, toward the uh, end of the game, I think they were up two to one. They just they went into this total temper tantrum and everybody was looking at me, looking at my uh, parents, their grandparents, <laughs> looking at my brother and trying to figure out why are they having a temper tantrum? And they came back to us and they were like, I don't want the game to stop. I want to keep on playing. <laughs> so that's why they were having the temper tantrum because they wanted the game to go on for hours and hours and hours. And they were just upset because they had to stop 
playing this soccer game that they were in the middle of, and therefore they went into a temper tantrum. Like I said, they are um, now at the age of 11 and 12, about to be 12 and 13, and I think this was like maybe when they were around 8 or 9, so it was a few years back and everything. But that story just resonates with me because so often we don't think about how much the kids and even the adults love being involved in these games of life. And it can be just something simple as a pickup game. Because I know folks that are adults that get upset when the pickup game of basketball is done or the pickup game of football or whatever other pickup games they might be playing as well. But, Kyla, what are some of the things that you've got on your plate? So, first, John, thank you. Like, I just, I love it when I get to meet new people and learn new things. And um, it was just such a joy to meet you. Mark, thank you so much for bringing the two of us here together. Like, again, great Mwah. Excellent choice, I think. Um, so I'm a coach and I have a team. We're called Team Go Big. And you can find us at teamgobig.life, not .com, .life, teamgobig.life. Um, we are committed to a radical level of body inclusivity in sport and in the world. So it doesn't matter your gender, your race, your body size, your whatever, what kind of bike you have, the shoes you wear, whatever. You are welcome on our team. You can go to teamgobig.life, learn more about the team. There's a little thing. You can click on it, get on my calendar. We can chat about uh, whatever challenge it is that you want to go after. doesn't have to be triathlon. Um and what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, uh, I'm on Instagram. That's where I am, where I'm authentic and awesome and whatever. Well, that's, you know, Instagram.com, whatever. And it's go big. This is where it gets the thing. Embodiment. So I-N body, B-O-D-Y, M-E-N-T, meant. Embodiment. It's the kind of uh, life coaching or body image coaching that I do along with triathlon. Um, we are really looking forward to an amazing, amazing race season this year, traveling all over the place. The biggest, most exciting thing is we have our very first West Coast race uh, in Southern California in July, and uh, we are just just tickled about it. And um, on a personal athlete level, um, I am racing my heart out this year to qualify to go to the World Championships in Australia in 2022. I went in 2019 to Spain and just missed the mark, missed the time cutoff for the bike and uh, for the last loop of the bike. And so I'm going back to, to try and do it again. And uh, I hired a coach. I hired two coaches. So uh, I'm sure John will agree with me. Great coaches get coached. Um, and so it sounds like John is a really great coach. If you're a coach and you need coaching, and if you're an athlete and you need coaching, come find me at Team Go Big. Sounds great and everything. One of the things that I really enjoyed uh, while watching the NCAA basketball this weekend, and like I said, I'm going to try to watch the championship game later on tonight and everything, was seeing people that were uh, not necessarily – uh, what we would consider the norm and everything in the sense of athletic size and all of that. Cause one of the guards, I believe it was the guard for UCLA is not your standard size of the big guards these days. They were actually relatively short and all of that comparatively to the rest of them, but they went in there with the timber all game long. And even though that particular team lost, I think that, um, I can't remember. I think they're coming back next year. I'm not sure if they were a senior or not, but it does seem to me that if I remember correctly, they might be coming back next year, but whether they are or are not, they've definitely had the experience and definitely, um, seem to not mind going in there with the trees. And then we saw a lot of women that were actually as tall as myself that were playing in the, the women's game and some that were yeah. even taller than me. I think there was one that they gave her height is like 6'2 or something like that. Yeah. So definitely we've seen a lot of folks that are not necessarily falling within the, the traditional sizes that people may be yeah. thinking about. So it's good that yeah. you're doing that kind of work to fight yeah. against those stereotypes. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the question that I always ask all the guests at the end, and that's what I was going to ask, is that throughout the interview, we talk about a lot of different issues, a lot of different things, but I always give people a chance to give their word of positivity, their word of encouragement that they would like to give to our global community. Because the International Broadcast mm -hmm. Media is a podcast network that Nick Palveda and Kim Calhoun founded, and it's got programmers 
from around the country. I know we've got a program, a music program out of South Africa. We've got a kind of spirituality program out of Nigeria. We've got guests and folks that come from as far away as New Zealand to other parts of the United States to um, England to just be in a true global community. So any words of encouragement that you would like to share with the audience in general? And I'll start off with you, Kala, and then go to John. But any words of positivity or encouragement that you would like to give to our global community? Ah, you're giving John the advantage. Um, All right, so here's what I always tell all my athletes. You are already ready. You don't need to wait another moment to get started on whatever it is that your heart is calling you to do. You are already ready. Don't wait anymore. Go for it. Sounds great. What about you, John? Any words of encouragement or positivity that you would like to share? I I go back to the ancient rock group journey and don't stop believing. And that has a double negative in there. So I look at the idea as belief. Belief. Love it. Definitely. Great idea. Great thoughts. I want to thank both of you for being guests. As I oftentimes tell many of my guests, do know that you may be reached out to again on Potted or some of the other platforms because you were both amazing guests. And I look forward to having you come back and share your journeys in the near future and could make a return trip. So don't think that it was just a one-time, one-off <laughs> visit at the radio show with Mark Lee. I'm hoping that you'll appear either on this show or on some of the other shows that I am doing for international broadcast media. So I want to thank both of you for being a tremendous guests and look forward to seeing you again in the very near future. You got it. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. No problem. So we're going to be ready to bring a couple of the spots of upcoming shows that also exist here on this platform, including Chess Stars, because we've got a lot of folks that are all about chess here and everything. So Sasha is actually in Canada. So we're going to let you check a little bit about Chess Stars as well as Talking Upstream, which is a show that we have where people are creating entire movies and a TV series, and they're doing that on Sundays. But Chess Stars is actually doing the course of the week. So let's see what Sasha has got to say about his show. We'll be right back. 